This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for The Rant with Barbara Rose Brooker. Now, if you don't know who she is, I want you to do me one big favor. Go to agemarch.org, and you will find out who this marvelous woman is. Mm. She's a writer, but she's the founder of the Age March that includes all of us, no matter our age. Today, Barbara, you have two fantastic guests. Tell us about them. Oh, my God. I have two fantastic, not only people, but very legendary, supreme, important literary agents. I just want to start the show by saying books are everything. Books record our culture and our infinite futures, and books are more important and the legacy of life on this planet. And there's always this mystery. You know, what about the agents? You know, people talk about the Max Perkins or an agent who's portrayed in a movie or something. What do the agents do? I say they give birth to the books and they, they, they promote a culture with voices and stories and history that infinitely lives on. So to me, the relationship of book and life is the most important. Okay, listeners, you all want to write a book or you've written a book. Um, you want to know about agents. You know, what is their role? What is the agent's role? So I'm just going to start off with the first question, and either Laura or Andy can jump in. And the first question I want to know is, what inspired you to become a literary agent? I know, oh, I want to say, I'm sorry, I didn't even introduce, I didn't even say your names because I got so excited. Okay, Laura Mazur was, for 18 years, I believe, the editor executive editor at Seal Press. She is now with an agent with Wendy Sherman Associates in New York. Laura represents New York Times bestsellers and many other, there's much more I can say about her, but I wanna let them talk more. Andy Ross really is that legend. He not only is the owner, was the owner of the famed fame Cody's books, but he became a lit agent in 2008. And he also is responsible for many important voices that are out there. And both Laura and Andy are working currently and tirelessly in this difficult world, getting voices, important voices out there. So I want to know what inspired you to become agents? Was it a book? Was it that you wanted voices in the world or whatever? And let's, let's just start with either Andy or Laura. Well, I, um, I suppose I did it um, for, I, I don't really know why I did it. I, I had been in the retail, I owned a bookstore for 30 years. And finally, Cody's closed because mostly because people's buying habits had changed. And I didn't know what I would do. I'd been a bookseller all my life, so I thought I'd be sacking groceries at Safeway. Um, and I don't know, one night I woke up and um, decided that the next best thing to sacking groceries was to become a, a literary agent. It was, it was the other side of the publishing food chain. Um, and um, I really love it. It's very creative. Um, uh, Alfred Knopf, the legendary publisher once said that agents are to um, publishers as a knife is to a throat. And um, that now they, they, they won't, big publishers won't accept unagented submissions. So we kind of, um, um, we're kind of the gatekeeper. And I am assuming that we bring some value to the publishers as well as to the authors. Mm -hmm. So that's how I became an agent. Well, it is true. It's both the publishers and authors. And what about you, Laura? What yeah, is I, it, 
Yeah, there are all kinds of gatekeepers in that long chain of players between author and final publication. Um, and for many years, as you said, I was an in-house editor. I was on the buying side. I was on the end of the table where we would look at proposals and assess them and decide which ones to invest in and which ones would be better for another publisher. And being in-house for all those years was both wonderful and exciting and so um, the excitement was palpable to be a part of it. Um, but ultimately, when you work in house, your number one ally, the person you are most responsible for, is not the author. As much as you want to champion the author and, and always do and, and advocate for the author, ultimately it's the publisher who pays your salary and it makes sense that you have to respond to at the end of the day. As an agent, the person I'm most devoted to, that my number one priority is the author. I can advocate without having to worry about what it means to me in-house in terms of the next set of books or the books after that. It can just be about that one book, that one author, and advocate as best I can knowing what I do know about having been on the inside. And that is a joy because it's at the end of the day, the authors are working so hard to make that book happen, it is not an easy system on the, on the life of a writer. And if I can do something to make that process more uh, comfortable, exciting, fulfilling, uh, both in the experience and in the financial aspect, then I think I, uh, then, then that's where I want to be. So, so you as an agent and Andy as agents, you establish relationships with the publishers before do you, do you develop relationships with the editors at the, at the houses? And then when an author sends you a project, you decide where you're going to go with it? Or does it work the other way? Does the book come out and then you establish relationships? No, the way, the way we do it is we decide, first of all, which projects we want to take on. And I, I don't know, I assume this is the same with Laura. I get at least 20 unsolicited queries a day, mm -hmm. including at Christmas, on Christmas Day. Yeah. Uh, and I select very few of those. And then I also get, um, you know, I have, I have clients that have their second book out. So, so I get books from a number of sources and presumably uh, with my experience as an agent, I, I know the imprints in New York that are most um, likely to take on a project, and I know the editors at the specific imprints who um, who would be most amenable to them. It's always hard to tell. It's not a. There's no science here. It's very um, subjective, so you don't always know who's who's the best um, editor for it. But at least you're not going to send your book of Marxist criticism to a cookbook editor. Right. Right. So so. What do you think, both of you, in this culture right now, we have a thing called self-publishing. In my day, when I was first publishing, we didn't have self-publishing, but now we have self-publishing. So there are thousands or millions, would you say, of books that are now on Amazon sitting right next to a book from Knopf, say. And are, how do agents feel about self-published books or has it intruded on, on your role as an agent? I don't find that it's intruded. Uh, I do like that it's becoming more democratized and what was once called a vanity press mm -hmm. then became self-publishing right. right. and now there is a whole another there's a whole second layer of vocabulary there's something called a hybrid publisher uh -huh. which is um it, the model is self-publishing and that the author chooses to be published and funds the production of the book but they partner with a team that mm -hmm. will help them to create that book in a way that looks and feels professional uh which is wonderful i think oh. that the I love that the stigma has been removed from self-publishing or hybrid publishing. Mm -hmm. and there are many books where going that route makes a whole lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it can be a wonderful choice. What I would say it, to when you said that, oh, well, we are now seeing self-published books sitting right alongside books from the mainstream publishers. We are and we aren't. 
We are because you can go on Amazon or Barnes and Noble's website or any of the Indies websites and see all the books. So technically they're side by side digitally, but are they side by side in the marketplace? If you look at the major national reviews, they're not reviewing the self-published books. And if you look at the distribution into the stores, not that right now we're visiting a lot of stores, but the distribution factor is a big deal still. And those books are not getting the same distribution that the big five and the other mainstream publishers are. So there's right. still like an apples and an oranges thing. Um, and I, but that's not to say that the self-publishing model isn't incredibly beneficial for certain kinds of books. I would encourage people to consider it. It's, it's very interesting because I've done both. Um, but it, it's, it's interesting because I hear so many people saying, I have a fabulous self-published book and oh my God, this and that. But can I get an agent to represent it? And that's a question I don't know. I don't think, do well, agents represent? Yeah, I get a lot of questions like that. When I first got in, became an agent in 2008, um, publishers were talking a lot about finding really good self-published books and then buying them up. And they're not doing that much anymore. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, what they want is new material. And, um, and, I, uh, and I get that in, in a lot of query letters that they just want to, the, the publisher to give it the kind of marketing power that they can't do. And the truth is, unless you're a very kind of a big name author, you're not going to get all that marketing power. They're, they're not going to put their resources into supporting your book unless your book has sold impressive numbers uh, as a self-published book. But if it has, why do you want to go to a publisher anyway? You, you know, right. the royalties aren't as good. Right, right. And why so, would the publisher want to take on a book that has already sold to a significant right. portion of its That's audience? The other side. Yeah. It's, now, it's, a, it's a catch 22. If it doesn't sell well self published, the publisher would say, Why would we want to try if you couldn't pull it off? And if you did sell well self published, then the publisher is going to say, But you already hit your audience. It's very tricky to find that middle ground and have something rebooted that's already been out in the marketplace. I know. I, know. I tell people I just want to. Um, I just I want to see their next project. Yeah. You don't want to what? I didn't hear that. I tell people I want to see their next project. That I, oh, I their next project. Uh huh. Now they're you, you know you know they ask me why should I uh, why should I go with a major publisher? I only get a royalty of ten percent, whereas mm-hmm. if I self publish the book, I get sixty percent. Mm-hmm. And it's a it's a very good reasonable question. Uh, and and sometimes it's true publishers don't do very much and they let the book die. Uh, but as you pointed out, there are some advantages, a lot of which have to do with your um, platform and your bona fides. If, you're, if you have a Kanak book, it means a lot more, mm-hmm. um, even if the book isn't selling well from Kanak, and a lot of oh, them don't. That, that's um, interesting. And your, your book is eligible for awards, which they, a self-published mm-hmm. book in most cases wouldn't be. Mm-hmm. Um, your book's going to get par- carried by bookstores. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and um, you will get more review attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I know if I get a lot of clients who are previously published, and even if the book hasn't done well, if, they're, if they were a Kanak author, it means something. Mm-hmm. How important is platform to the, the authors you choose? I think that depends um, on the category. Mm-hmm. It depends on the book. It depends on which audience. It mm-hmm. is intended to reach. Many categories do really, if not require, they do um, at, hope for a solid platform, a built in audience in some way that will seed buzz when you send the book out into the world and let the world know it exists. Because if the world doesn't know it exists, you're not publishing the book, you're printing the book, right? Mm -hmm. You want to print it or publish it. If you want to publish it, the world has to know it's there. And to let the world know it's there in a world where there are way too many books for all the media coverage we would hope for, we have to rely on the author's own audience to seed that first spark. But there are certain categories where it's not necessary. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's less essential for novels. Andy, you, you should be the one to correct me if I say anything here that you think is off. But I would say for novels, it's a little bit less essential than if le- it's a lot less essential for a novel than, say, like a business leadership book. Oh, yeah, I agree. Right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think uh, for, if for debut fiction, um, platform is less important than the story. Um, but still, I'm, you know, but then there is a problem is if your first novel bombed, 
that's your platform. You're an author whose book didn't sell. It's sometimes easier to publish a debut novel than uh, the second novel of an author whose book sold 500 copies. The previous book sold 500 copies. Really? For nonfiction, and particularly for prescriptive nonfiction, it's all about platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and even for any other kind of nonfiction, um, uh, I mean, what is platform? A lot of the people, they, they're kind of, writers are sort of perplexed about it. So I like to tell people, um, either you have an endowed chair at Harvard or you're sleeping with Oprah's hairdresser. You know, either you have authority or you have access to the media, probably both. And it's important because nowadays, um, and really like during, in, during COVID, um, um, sales are being driven by media and, and they want a story. You're only gonna get 30 second interview or something on, on mm -hmm. entertainment tonight. And you're not news if you don't have a platform. You know, so it's, important. it's interesting, the conversation we're having here, because it relates to just about everything that's happening in 2020. Um, you know, when we started podcasting four or five years ago, there weren't a lot of podcasts. There were some, but there weren't like there are today. Everybody believes they have a podcast platform. It's an and, email now. And so... You know, you're only as good as reaching your audience. And that's the same thing that I'm hearing that you're saying with a book. If the book is really good and it's engaging, you know, you could self-publish it, but there's a lot of work behind that, pushing it out there. Let me, let me just say one more thing, though. I don't want to be too discouraging here because um, there are books that, um, that get published. There's books that I get published all the time where the author really doesn't have a platform. And platform is, is a huge challenge and it's important, but there are always exceptions to it. And when you do a book proposal through writing nonfiction, you need to make the case why, in spite of your modest platform, this book is gonna reach an audience. Yeah. And there are a lot of books like that. And what about sales? There's so many wonderful books out there and then, I find out that there aren't any sales on them. How does an agent feel about that? When the sales the books are, not selling? Yeah, I mean, I mean the sales wants to books. aren't so great. The publishing industry at large is not a huge profit margin bus, uh, enterprise. Right? I think, uh, I, I haven't heard recent statistics, but I'm gonna say that somewhere between like 70 and 80% of the books in the marketplace don't earn out their investment. And it's the other remaining books that sell well, big blockbusters, okay. the best sellers, even mm -hmm. like the solid mid-list books that maybe had a lower investment but had a nice mm -hmm. profit sales margin mm -hmm. that pay for everything else. So a book not selling enough copies to earn back its investment is not a surprise to anybody. Nobody likes it. Mm -hmm. I'd like my own statistics to be far from 70% not profitable, but mm -hmm. no one's surprised to see that. What do we do with assessing the value of something in the marketplace if it doesn't earn back its investment? Well, there are other ways to assess that uh, that success. First of all, did it earn it? it even if it's even if you you just like earn break even for the publisher, that's a nice thing. Um, if the book sold well, forget the actual profit and loss statement, but if the book has significant numbers, you can look and say, oh, X number of people bought this book. That's a testament to the author, to the value of the content. And that reflects well on the publisher, the agent, the editor, et cetera. Um, of course, we always want books to be profitable. We want to make money. But the reality is it's a very, very expensive enterprise to make a book. And what we can expect from the return on every single book isn't going to be the same. Mm -hmm. How do you, how, how many books do you choose, both of you? Like you only, you have to eat and sleep and live your life. <laughs> and then reading all these manuscripts and listening to all us authors complain and think we're the only ones and all of that on top of being supreme legendary agents. How many books can you handle? I mean, do you give yourself a quota of how many books you're going to represent? No. I, you know, I, I think of myself as sort of a literary gigolo, which is to say I, <laughs> I will represent books that I think I can see. Um, but I get a lot of queries 
uh, every day and I take on very few and I will take on as many as I think I can sell. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that's, you know, sometimes I'll sell only five or six books a year and sometimes mm -hmm. I'll sell 20. I don't know that mm -hmm. I've ever sold more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's, there's a lot of rejection in this business. And I think if you are going to try to find an agent or if you're, um, that you need to understand that. I mean, publishers are publishing books actually during the time of COVID. I think people are buying books. I don't think business is all that bad in spite of all the challenges. They're that buying we have. books, yeah. But there is a lot of rejection and you just have to be able to handle that. I get rejection. Um, you know, for every book that I sell, I'll get 25 rejections and maybe one offer. For, for a long time, I only knew Laura from her rejection letters to me when she was an editor. And it turned out, when I finally met her, she turned out to be a much nicer person than I thought. My rejection letters are lovely. <laughs> they were lovely. lovely there's no such thing as a lovely rejection letter. It's, you know, I, I felt like my job was like my social life in high school. But um, I'm but getting my payback published. now, Andy. I'm getting my payback now because I'm with you now. I'm sending out and getting the like, you know, 20 no's to the five yeses. And so I, I earned well, my comeback. And, and it takes a long time too because you have to do the reading. You have to do the reading, then the deciding. And I think a lot of writers think it just, you know, happens. You look at it and go, wow, here's the contract, you know. And there, there's really a lot of um, mystifying out there about the role of the agent. And everybody wants an agent. And I think the whole thing is mystifying. The entire publishing industry, yeah. it's as though it's behind a velvet curtain. <clears throat> what happens behind the curtain is very insider and everyone on the outside is a little like cloudy eyed about what's happening. And I really feel for authors. It's not an easy system to navigate at all. And so mm -hmm. much of it is subjective and taste driven, right? What if you have something wonderful, but it's just like, if I get something in and it's terrific, but I don't have a spark for it. Mm -hmm. I can't get it on. I don't have a vision for how to publish it. And it's right. very, right nuanced and subjective and taste driven. And to say to a writer, this just, and I see these, I get these rejections and I send these rejections. I didn't have a spark for this mm -hmm, personally. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure that that's not a lovely note to receive. And I've received it myself when I'm pitching, but I wish it were otherwise. It's a relationship. It truly is. It's, it's like a, you know, a constant blind date <laughs> you know you're having these relationships and and as an author i know i've gone through those various things but but you really have to you really have to understand that it rejection is not a bad word it's just that the agent if maybe the book isn't right for them yeah. so well, i think it's important to understand really. I, I reject most of the books that i get but when i take one on um, it's because for some reason, I really love it. If it's a novel, I just am engrossed by it. If it's nonfiction, it's because it's, it's either an entertaining subject or an important subject, whatever it is, it has to be well-written and I still get rejected. But, um, by the time I take on a book, it is a good book. It is a book Boy. that ought to get published, but it may still not get published. And it would be for marketing reasons, mm -hmm. not necessarily because the book isn't good. It's like what Laura said mm -hmm. is, they can't visualize how to market the book. And I remember I had a wonderful novel that I couldn't, that I almost sold. And, and they said, well, you know, we thought it was too dark for um, reading groups. Oh, that's a marketing decision. Oh, it's not a marketing decision. decision. Yes. And, and that's what they, that's more often than not what they do. And those are changing too. Have, have you two had miss, are there certain books that you said, that became like bestsellers, you know, number one bestsellers that you had turned down. Are there any of those stories? <laughs> As an um, editor, there were books that I wanted to bid on, but mm -hmm. the way an editor, when an editor assesses a book project from an agent, it's, the editor doesn't read it, say, I like this, here's an offer. The, that's not how that works. There's another round of gatekeeping. The editor then has to take it to a board. There's a boardroom and a board that sits right. in, 
you know, either literally or metaphorically in a room together. And it, mm-hmm. it's that room where it's marketing and publicity and sales and, and maybe foreign rights, production. Mm-hmm. And all of those people get to weigh in before any decision yes. is made. So yes. if I go back to the author and say, here's the reason I may present it as though it's me, it may seemingly be for me, but really it's from the whole team. There's a lot of us, but there have been books that have made bestseller lists that I have brought to my team and not been granted the right to, to offer. Mm-hmm. And I've also made offers on books and not one that have gone mm-hmm. on to do well. And all you can do is applaud them and say, it's not a zero sum game. We'll all get our shot at, Oh, I heard that you have one that is is a bestseller or going to be a bestseller or on the way. I heard something about a book you have. Can oh. you mention it? I don't. I don't know which one you're referring oh, to. Oh, is that somebody said to me? Oh, Laura Mazer has this book that's coming out or just came or it came out. Yes, yeah, she said. I. I yeah. Is it the, uh, so I have a book that's debuting this, this, I'll give it a little plug if you guys don't mind. It's very exciting. It's been reviewed everywhere, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Um, it's going to be in the New Yorker, Paris Review, everywhere. It's so exciting. It's the biography of Louise Fitzhugh, who oh. wrote Harriet the Spy. Yes, and I it, think that's the one. She was a counterculture genius. She was a lesbian in an era when lesbians did not write children's books. Mm -hmm. Um, Her life was fascinating. She came from the poor racist South and fled as soon as she could to Greenwich Village. And her life unfolds in this beautiful book by Leslie Brody. And um, I'm just excited. It's it's what I call um, a testament to a literary legacy that we overlooked. And um, bringing back those literary legacies to give them a life in the contemporary well, culture, I think, is very that's exciting. That's wonderful. wonderful. Congratulations. Thank I you. Love the literary Thank legacy you. that you said that. A literary legacy. Do both of you um, know? I know that Laura now does upmarket fiction, but Andy, you do all nonfiction, right? No, I. No, uh, you're uh, doing uh, fiction. No, hard to sell. I, I do a, Andy I does have some fiction. really good success with. Uh, um, teenage, teen and middle grade fiction. Um, mm-hmm. But fiction is difficult to sell. So um, I'm very selective. I do have a, some adult fiction, but most of my books are nonfiction for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nonfiction then, is a little quote unquote easier to sell because you have a little bad. bit more of an, what do you say? It's, well, yeah, no, it is easier to sell, but it's not easy. It's not easy at all. It's just that it's easier to tell if it's going to sell. And easier to know where to send it, which imprint would be the right yeah. fit. Oh. And I, I have a better sense of whether it's going to sell or not. With fiction, it's all kind of a night and fog. You just never know. You have to I mean, fiction falls in love with it. Yeah. And you just don't know how that's going to work. I know. And it has an umbrella because isn't a memoir, for those of you listeners out there who want to turn your life into a bestseller and you want to write memoirs, but memoirs are often called fiction it, there's so many labels now as well in some well, ways memoirs they're treated usually... as fiction, right in some way they're treated as fiction because the storytelling is more essential than ever in the nonfiction mm-hmm. category mm-hmm. so there is that expectation that the memoir will read as though it's an incredibly riveting story arc driven piece of mm-hmm. narrative fiction yeah, even though no. it's true. Yeah, memoir is tricky because it has to read like fiction, but it has to be more grounded in reality than fiction. And you know, life is boring. You know, most most of my you know, I'm in the basement, you know, for eight hours a day. That's not a very good story. So what you have to figure out if you're writing a memoir, first of all, it's difficult to have perspective because it's about the most important story to you, which is you, <laughs> but it may not be important to the reader, and and you have to write something. You know, the reader's the king. Um, so you have to figure out a memoir is not your life. That's a biography. Mm -hmm. Um, a memoir is a story within your story. And it's almost as important to know what to leave out as what to put in. So it's, it's, it's tough to write memoirs that, that are going to work commercially. It's hard, it's hard, but, but isn't, but in the marketplace, often in bookstores, I see how it's separated fiction, memoir. And I always wonder why they're not just all put together, you know. Well, memoir isn't fiction. Right. I, 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 In theory. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, 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 always a, it's a question I, 
I talk about a lot because when I, I read a book like uh, The Liars Club, which everybody mm -hmm. wants to write the mm -hmm. next Liars Club, mm -hmm. you know, and she has these dialogues going on when she's five years old and yeah. she doesn't remember the di dialogues, you know, the white, the, the glass castle, for instance. Oh, so um, there's a lot of invention going on there. There has to be, um, but there's sort of a contract between the memoirist and the reader that it's grounded in reality. Okay, mm -hmm. and more so than say a Romana Clay, which is sort of loosely based on your life, real, or something. your right. real life, yeah. Um, Changes and so it's, it's, it's a little bit murky, but um, mm -hmm. you, you do have some flexibility in reconstructing scenes with with a memoir, but it really it really is like a contract. Well, when you think of Aniasman, I, I I'm still reading some of her books that I took out of the library because I love. I love it. I'm just salivating after every word. That's considered a memoir, a niacin, right? Yes. Yeah, the diaries. Of the Anais. diaries, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, the niacin. But, but, you know, for the listeners out there who are probably so intrigued that two important agents are talking about this, there's so much to talk about because they really want to know, well, I have a book, but how do I get an agent? Or I have a book, do I need an agent? That's the big question I get a lot. Do I need an agent? Um, or the other one is, well, he hasn't answered me. And, um, you know, there's all these, this, this drama around the literary agents who are really working, working, working hard. They're White House. They're like the president. They're our president-elect. Thank I you. <laughs> <laughs> our president-elect um, trying to um, enhance the world, to change the world. They really are because they're getting voices out there that are going to go into libraries and to go into generations. And that's so important in keeping the world going around. But then you're one person sitting in a room with all your books and everything. I wonder how you do it. And all these listeners out there, I'm telling you, they're going to be pitching you with their um, books today. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's, it's easy to get intimidated when you're looking for an agent. First of all, you don't always need an agent. But if you want to get published by the big New York houses at this point, right. you pretty much have to have an agent. You're you not do. going to accept unsolicited um, manuscripts. Um, I think what you, if you're doing nonfiction, you have to have a book proposal. Um, I, I would recommend reading this book, which I That's self published. Andy's book, there which is a literary agent's is guide to really, nonfiction book. Proposal. Really good, and it, you make it simple. You make it simple, but it's not because it depends on the writer, of course. It's that very short, true. and what's more important, I make fifty cents every time you buy it. So, um, but I think you need to write a good book proposal and you need to uh, have a good query letter as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, then you have to do research on agents and that intimidates people, but it isn't that hard. What I recommend people do is go to agentquery.com. It's a, it's a website with several thousand agents. Um, Laura's on it, I'm on it. Um, and you can um, hit a button essentially, like if you've written a memoir, um, you hit a button and it brings up all of the agents who are specifically looking for memoirs. Mm -hmm. And then you, they link to the uh, publisher's web or to the agent's website. So you want to find out a couple of things. You want to find out if, if the agent is kind of an asshole because you don't want to work with them. Sometimes mm -hmm. hard to know. Um, you want to know what kind of books they're publishing. If they're only publishing memoirs by, by chefs and you're writing a memoir about your life in, in, in you know, radical you know, um, politics in the 60s, they may not be the right agent for you. Um, and you shouldn't be intimidated by name, by, by name dropping. Agents are inveterate name droppers. They're always gonna promote their big name offers. I remember when I really? first went to New York as an, as an agent, I was meeting with editors who do the same thing. Uh, and I was, it was my first trip to New York and I was intimidated and I asked this editor, what you know, what, what she was looking for. And she said, well, probably my best known author is Barack Obama. So, you know, I was more yeah. intimidated. Yeah. But she was looking for new material. She calls me up. And, yeah. and if an agent says they're looking for new material, if they're mm -hmm. looking for new projects, then they are. Then they are. Um, 
And then the third thing you look at on their website are their submission guidelines. And fortunately now, most agent submission guidelines are more or less the same. They, they might be a little bit different, so you should always check them out. They always want um, um, electronic submissions. They usually will accept multiple submissions. Sometimes they want longer query letters, sometimes shorter. Sometimes they want attachments. Sometimes they want things embedded. Mm -hmm. um, but it isn't, and then send it out and expect you'll get some rejects, like a lot. A lot. But then you find the right guy and they fall in love with it and that's it. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing process. It's an amazing, I, I really admire the agents because it's a lifelong commitment. And do you read a lot yourselves? Do you have your favorite books and do you spend the time during, particularly during the COVID right now where people are just, I find myself, you know, spending hours reading at night or you're in the basement, Andy, you say, <laughs> are you reading? <laughs> Um, yeah, and most, most agents I know are book lovers. You know, mm -hmm. that's why they became agents. They didn't become agents to get rich because it's a hard thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we're all, all of the, you know, when I first became an agent, I had this image of sort of snooty, um, pseudo sophisticated New Yorkers. It used to be pipes. here. Yeah. They exist. They, really, they still exist. The agents still, I know aren't like that. <laughs> but the agents that we hang with aren't like that. No, agents really care about the author. They yeah. want to advocate. Yeah. I don't know any agents that don't care deeply about the author and the author experience and really want to be that, um, that bridge between the author and the publisher. Sometimes the publisher will be in a position of having to share bad news with the author or the author and is in a position of wanting to push back against a publisher's decision. And if they engage each other in a moment of contention, it can be tricky, difficult. Certainly the author is at a disadvantage because they're not in the power position. Mm -hmm. And they're generally, even if you've had six books already go out into the world, you're still not in the publishing industry day after day after day. You don't have the same awareness of which levers you can pull and which ones you can't mm -hmm. but agents mm -hmm. know agents know what happens on the inside and agents understand the financial and systemic decisions that are being made yeah. we're in a better position to go in and advocate to fight for what an author wants oh, yes. share the news with an author in a way that lands a little better if it's not mm -hmm. great news just to make the whole experience better for everybody it, it, so it's so it's three-dimensional an agent is, is it like, it's an important relationship. Then an agent has a lot, really. I, I mean, my respect grows all the time. Um, Andy and I were talking in the beginning. My first agent was Fred Hill, who died. And um, Andy, you remember how Fred was one of the, he was, he was an unusual guy. He was he really a good guy. Was. Well, I knew him when he was a publisher. Pardon me? I knew him when he was a publisher. Was a oh, publisher. yeah, that's right. You knew him when he was a Yeah, yeah. But, but the thing, the, the agent has, has so much responsibility, and I, and I really admire it. I'm in awe of it, actually. I really see hand in hand. It, it, for those who want to be a writer, an author, I should say, I think the agent is extremely important. It's, it's, it's it's like it's like a, a temporary marriage, <laughs> you know. There, there's an understanding, well, a connection. It's a very but emotional relationship. Emotional, and, yes. Um, I, I think uh, and I, I have a lot of clients I've never met before. Some I've never mm -hmm. even spoken to. I only do email, but I feel like I've known them all my life because of through the book a and the relationship. Yeah, and you know, agents take fifteen percent commission. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's important that when you find an agent, you're going to find somebody who will work for you. I know mm -hmm. a lot of people, some of my clients have gotten these kind of big name agents and they haven't really been served well. I mean, these, these guys are, a lot of them are, some of them are really good. Some of them are successful because they're successful. You know, they had a, they have some big name authors and then other big name authors go to them, but they don't always work really hard for you. And I think if you're just getting started as a writer, um, you don't want somebody who's a complete newbie who doesn't know anything about book publishing, but you do want an agent 
mm-hmm. who's going to work for you. And, and, you know, I know a lot of these big agents, they'll, they'll, they'll send it out to 10 big publishers, the same big 10, mm-hmm. and it gets rejected and then they, they drop it. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, want to get published and they're happy to get published by a smaller press. And mm-hmm. you need to have an agent who, who's willing to, you know, to yeah. walk the walk. And, and, get and or published. if they sell Even it. If that agent, right. Even if they sell it. it, once they sell it, they disappear. And yeah. I've seen this more times than I can be over and over again. I've seen this happen. A book gets sold in, even if it's not a small house, even if it's medium or big, the book gets sold in the agent's like, I did my job. The contract is signed. Let me know when the book comes out or send me an email when they're what we call major milestones. Like um, the book is going to the printer, the jacket design is ready. And they weigh in maybe two times at most in the entire, uh, uh, story arc of the book being created and that's all and yeah. I would really love to see the yeah. agents that I love and admire the most are the ones that show up who care who are invested all along the way that said agents do have a lot of authors that they have to serve well and so there is a little bit of a disbursement of your energies and resources but selling the book and then disappearing to me is the sign of an agent who's not invested in the author well, sometimes it's the author's fault, though, that they, you know, they they leave me out of the loop, and I sometimes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I think they're, you know, that's agents earn money. They you might as well make them earn their money. I just uh, a book came out. Uh, one of my clients, I just found out the book had been out for a month, and I hadn't heard for either from him or the publisher. And oh. first of all, I felt bad, like I hadn't done my job. Oh, but I so also it works the other they, way. Yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, and it was a book I love I love and I oh. so now I'm trying to make up for lost time but they they kind of put me out of the loop. That's that's and he didn't get yeah. his money's worth. Well, I guess there's good. I mean, there there's really caring people on both ends, and uh, particularly when it comes to writers. You know, another thing. Speaking of ageism, there's so many people now sixty up. I call them 60 up. And when they come to my classes at Ollie, you know, at San Francisco State Ollie, and they say, I've always wanted to write a book. And I didn't have time or I didn't think I could. Is it too late? And I always say, oh, it's never too late. The moral of the story is that several people that I feel so honored to have had in my classes over a period of time, have published their books. They self-published because they didn't think an agent would even be possible because of their age. And I'm calling them tomorrow's new authors because now with self-publishing available, they never thought they could get an agent. They didn't even think about it. And some of these books are really, really good very fine very fine books so do you see a surge of um people uh, 60 plus coming to you with their books i mean once in a while we'll hear about the 88 year old woman where was she in new mexico who wrote the bestseller and then there was francis um, mays who wrote the book and it became the movie you know what i'm talking about but I think we're going to need more agents. I think that's what I'm saying. Well, my oldest, uh, my oldest client is actually my best known client. Daniel Ellsberg is 88 years old. Oh, and oh, I've, is he really that? And his I never did very he, well. <laughs> he really, he's real. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Congratulations. Um, well, I'm sure he loves you too. So. Oh, I didn't realize he was 88. That's making me feel better since I'm 84. Excellent. (laughs) Age is just a number. Remember that. No, it's not just a number. It's who we are. Well, that's true, too. You know what I mean. We no one should be defined by the number. I really believe that. But I think it's so interesting that so many more people are interested in writing their books right now they never thought they could before or they were too busy or they were going to law school raising families and i just wondered you know there's this filtration of people coming in with more books now um 
I, I just, I think that Laura and Andy, any author is lucky to have them as friends as well as agents. And I think you're doing important work, really important work. And I, it's, and it's not the kind of work that where you check into a startup and you make six figures in a week. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is really work that lives on just like our, our, our good films and our good music and, and our books do, to me is really the essence of life. So I say congratulations to you both. Thank you. Thank I really you. mean that from my heart. It almost makes me cry because I know I, I send out emails like writers do and I think, why did you do that? You know you're not supposed to do that. Think of the agent on the other hand, you know. So, oh, I want to ask you three words. This this will be ending our session and I hope it'll be the first of other series too because I there's going to be so many questions about the process of, of writing, of getting it to the agent, the agent's process, this and that. If you would like to, oh, I'd love to do another series, um, another podcast. But here's the three words. And all you need to do is come up with, you know, a one word response. Let's see. Writing. That's the word. It's one of you. One of what, you. What, I, I'm a little confused. There's, so, three, so, so there's one word. Okay. What, let's, are you in the three words? Yeah. You, yeah. Laura, yeah let's say we do Laura. For, we'll do Laura first. Like, if I give you a word, it's, it's you know, Barbara Walters used to do this. Remember with the word writing. What does that, what does that conjure up in you? I don't know. Blood, sweat, tears. Are we doing the three word thing? Good. I don't, uh, writing is uh, thankless and glorious. Oh, I love that. Andy, what would you say? I'm having a hard time. Um, I don't know. I, okay. I, I can't think of three words. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll end it on hope. Hope. For all of us. Karen, do you have one for hope? You know, hope is the continuation of taking one step in front of another. I love that, Karen. Hope that is, is so true. true. That's a so, good one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. And this she, reminds me of those six word memoirs that are popular, where people tell their story, their memoir oh. in six words. Uh, that's that's very fun. The New York Times does an occasional roundup of people's six word memoirs, and they're just a joy. Oh, that, that's right, the six word memoirs. Yeah, yes. I'm fascinated with the one word or change or diversity, you know, and the things that it comes up with. I thank you so much. And I also want to know where can the listener, if you want to give the information, if you want to give your website, um, where can they reach you? Um, I have a website at um, andyrossagency.com. Okay. Uh, and my agency website, when easily found online, Wendy Sherman Associates, wsherman.com. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good place to find me. And I'm also happy to have people follow on social media. And I say that because that's where if I'm holding an event or like an agent office hour, sometimes I'll open my Zoom doors and let people come in and mm -hmm. chat a little. They're welcome to find out there. Oh. Uh, I think those are the two best places to find me at the agency website, Wendy Sherman Associates, or my social media. That is great. And and do you go on LinkedIn or in any of those? You, yeah. LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Mm -hmm. I pretend to be on Twitter, but I'm really just a lurker. Well, ever since <laughs> Trump, I can't even say so the word. So noisy. <laughs> I can't even say the word Twitter. Twitter, Trump. <laughs> I liked Twitter when there were like seven people doing it. You know, that first six mm -hmm. months of Twitter was a blast. It just mm -hmm. felt like, you know, you're hanging out with people in, in the kitchen on your lunch hour. But then it became so big and noisy and full of voices. Yeah. And now I get a little, I want to hide under my desk. 
Well, that's what social media is all about. It is about getting very social old and busy and social. And, you know, I am very impressed with the two of you. I'm going to continue writing, but not publishing um, <laughs> because I'm very happy with what I'm doing. Um, but I do think that if you're going to write and want to publish, you got to do the research and you got to mm -hmm. understand. Uh, I don't take rejection well, so I'm not publishing. <laughs> Barbara, well, thank you so much for another wonderful podcast. Well, I want to also say thank you so much, Laura and Andy, personally. You're both absolutely delightful. And uh, I wish you safety. And Karen, oh, I wish you. you safety. And for all of you listeners who want to reach me at barbierosebooker.com, please do. And hmarch.org will be officially up next week. And it's going to be the first virtual Hollywood Network production, March 20th. Um, two producers are now in production, and it's going to be a global age march, age magnificently, AM, AM of every age, every race, every gender, every sexual orientation. So March 20th, this is going to be a very important event. So Wonderful. sign up at hmarch.org. And thank you to Karen again for letting me do this. Absolutely. Love you, Barbara. Thank Love you. you. And thank you. Thanks Laura. for having us. Have oh, I can't day. wait again. Bye. Thank you. Kisses. Bye.